Now, let me give you a course overview of what exactly we are going to cover in this course. So, in the first part, after the introduction to MATLAB and introduction to the course, we are going to talk about probability. Now, probability provides you a mean for modeling population, experiments, and other random phenomena. We are going to talk about probability distributions, which basically are a way of modeling random outcomes. Note that although very dry, probability theory is the foundation for statistics. Now, in statistics, we are going to learn something about the population based on a sample. Now, before continuing, let me explain the difference between population and sample. Think about the population as the entire collection of units that you are interested in analyzing. Don't think about population as just people, but population can also be objects. So for example, if you're interested in the quality control of car tires, then your population would be all car tires out there. The population is characterized by parameters. Those parameters are unknown and will always be unknown. But in order to learn something about those parameters, for example, when is a tire, when does a tire need to be replaced? You have to use a sample in the sense that you are taking a subset of the population and you're conducting a test on those as uh, on those subset. Now that subset is called a sample and we are going to use statistics to say something about the population. This concept is best illustrated with an example about two buckets. To illustrate the difference between probability and statistics, let us consider two buckets. The first bucket illustrates the concept of probability and the second bucket illustrates the concept of statistics. Suppose that in the first bucket you have a bunch of balls of different colors, green, black and red. And you also know how many of each color are there in the bucket. Probability theory tells you the expected number of green, red and black balls in your hand after pulling out a bunch of balls from the bucket. It will also tell you the likely distribution of the colors in your hand. Statistics is different. Again, you have a bucket, but you do not know what is in the bucket. Think about the content of the bucket as your population with unknown characteristics. To learn about the characteristics of the population, you will pull out a sample from the bucket. Based on the distribution of colored balls in your hand, you can use statistics to say something about the characteristics of your population, that is, the content of the bucket in this case. So when we talk about statistics, we are going to talk about confidence interval as well as hypothesis testing. Now, as mentioned before, a large part of this class will be devoted to regression analysis with MATLAB. Now, a regression analysis is basically constructing or building a mathematical relationship between variables. For example, if you're interested what determines the value of a home, then the price of the home or the home value will be what is called your dependent variable. And all the characteristics that you think influence that dependent variable, the home value in this case, are going to be your independent variables. And then the question is, if you think, for example, that the lot size, the location, the square footage, how many garages, whether there's a hardwood floor. If you're thinking about all those characteristics that may determine the price of the home, then the regression analysis will help you to construct a model that will then predict you the value of the home. Now, if you think about statistics and probability, then you should realize that there's uncertainty in everyday life. If you think, for example, about the grades in this class, you will see that there is uncertainty around the grade you are going to receive during this, during this semester. Now, you could associate probabilities with each grade. So, for example, if you are a statistics major in undergraduate, then you would probably associate a higher probability with getting an A or a B than with the other grades. But Statistics and probability is basically, can basically be found in any aspect of life. So think about the fire station cards. Now, this is a story that dates back from my time in Ames at Iowa State University, 
Then one morning I was standing at a red light and near that red light, there's a fire station. Now, when I was standing at that red light, two fire trucks came down the road and they were both with their sirens on and they both departed in opposite ways. Now, what that tells me is that at the same time, two, two 911 calls came in and those fire trucks had to be deployed in two different directions. Now note that the fire station in question only had three fire trucks. So if you are a public safety manager, you may be interested in what is the probability of actually two or three fire trucks being deployed from a particular station and what does that do in terms of risk management? Because suppose you only have a fire station that has three fire trucks and suddenly a call comes in for a fourth fire truck, then the a different station would have to respond, which would introduce inefficiency and also ineffectiveness. Okay. Now think about two outcomes, then having two outcomes does not mean that there's a 50-50 chance that either of those happens. The easiest is probably if you're thinking about making a basketball, uh, making a free throw in basketball. So Mark Price holds the record scoring free throws. Now the ball can get can go either into the basket or it cannot go into the basket. Just because there are two outcomes doesn't mean there's a 50-50 chance. Now, the reason I'm making this comment is about uh, an experience I had a long time ago when I was actually waiting on a flight in Ithaca, New York. Now, there was dense fog and the airplane couldn't land for us to take off. So I asked the gate agent what the probability is that the airplane is actually going to be able to land in dense fog. And the gate agent said, well, either the airplane lands or it doesn't land. So I guess there's a 50% chance that the airplane can land. Now note that this thinking is not correct. Now note that you're all exposed to statistics when you're actually on the consumer side. So think about your Netflix or your Amazon Prime membership. Then you should note that Netflix as well as Amazon Prime, as well as most other web pages, record the activity on your, on your account. So when you're looking at Netflix, for example, then Netflix, Netflix knows exactly where you are scrolling, what you are browsing, where you are pausing a movie, and also where you are rewind, rewinding a movie. And based on that information, Netflix can then say something about the population of what they like and what they dislike. 75% of viewings are based on recommendations by Netflix. So think about when you are, uh, when you are watching Netflix or when you are ordering something on Amazon Prime, then you're getting recommendation that says something like other people have bought X. Then those recommendations are not random, but they're actually determined by statistical models based on what you like and based on how you compare to other customers. The following slide is something that I have taken from the Netflix Media Center. What this shows is the episode that when watched resulted in 70% or more members finishing the entire series. That means the lower the number on the left-hand side, say for example, for Bates Motel, it is uh, I'd say a two. That means after watching the second episode, there's a 70% chance that people are actually going to watch the entire series. That means the lower the number, the earlier people are actually hooked to the series. Now, let me give you some other examples, because this is a Master of Public Affairs. Let me give you some other examples, more from the political arena. So in 2016, you had the presidential election and President Trump won that election, despite the fact that certain statistical web pages or certain polling web pages predicted a very low probability of Donald Trump winning. So, for example, 538 predicted that Donald Trump only has a 28.6% chance of winning. Now note that the 28.6% is higher compared to other polling numbers. Some said that there is a, only a 1% chance of him winning the election. 
Now the question is, what happened? Now, if you click on the link that is provided in the slides, you find an article that illustrates some of that tries to explain some of those uh, those results. The main argument of the article is as follows: You had states that are definitely going to uh, go uh, to Trump, and you had states that are definitely going to Hillary Clinton. Now you. The important part of what is what happens to the swing states. Now, what some pollsters have argued is that, well, some states may go to Donald Trump and some states may go to Hillary Clinton. But what they did not take into account that there's a correlation between those swing states in the sense that if one state goes to Trump, then there's a high chance that also other swing states are also going to Trump. For example, this can be explained if there is a certain subset of the population in those states that either show up to the polls or do not show up to the polls. So, for example, if you have a particular demographic that shows up in Wisconsin, then most likely that particular demographic is also going to show up in Florida. So it is not independent of if those swing states move in one or the other direction but it is that they're actually moving as a block in one or the other direction. You had a similar phenomena observed during the 2002 French presidential election. Note that the French presidential election works slightly different than the US elections. In France, you have a two-stage election. In the first stage, you have all the candidates and the two winners of the first stage are going into the second stage, that is two weeks after the first stage. And then after, in the second stage, it is only the top two candidates who are going, who are up for, uh, for the presidential position. What happened in 2002 is that all the polls suggested that the two people in the second stage are going to be Jacques Chirac and Lionel Jospin, which was the a socialist counterpart to conservative Jacques Chirac. This means that a lot of people didn't show up during the first stage. And what happened is that Jacques Chirac indeed made the, the second round, but the second place was not the, was not uh, Lionel Jospin, but was actually Jean-Marie Le Pen, who was an, who was an ultra right and ultra conservative candidate. This basically meant that in the second round, the French people basically had the choice between the status quo, which at the time was Jacques Chirac, or an ultra-conservative, an ultra-right-wing candidate. And here you can see on the election results that Jacques Chirac won the election by 82.2%, which means, which also shows you how unacceptable uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen was at the time. Statistics can also be found in the stock market, and especially in the stock market. So all of you right now are investing in stocks and mutual funds to finance your retirement. And then the question is, how are those stock values actually correlated with each other? You all know the saying that you shouldn't take, you shouldn't put all the eggs in one basket. But just because you're putting all your eggs in multiple basket, baskets doesn't mean that all those baskets are independent of each other. So let us do an example here. So on the left hand side, you see the evolution of two mutual funds. FSRPX is a mutual fund that contains large retailing companies in the United States. The other fund, VFINX, is the S&P 500. Okay, or is a fund that replicates the S&P 500. So on the left hand side is that you can see that those stocks actually move more or less together. On the right hand side, I have illustrated this relationship between the retailing stock and the S&P 500 in this scatter plot. Now you can see that if one stock goes up or if the, if the S&P 500 goes up, then also the retailing stock goes up and vice versa. Okay, so there are two different, there are two different funds 
However, they are related to each other. The last example I would like to talk about is the path of a hurricane. So here you see the path of Hurricane Sandy and let us just consider the red graph here or the red shape. Now, what the red shape is, is the following. <clears throat> when this red shape was created, the hurricane was right here at the bottom. And based on statistical models, and based on computer models and simulation models, the National Weather Service predicted the path of the hurricane. Okay? And you can see that there is also, you have the dots for the various time points. And also note that there is a cone around the path. This is what is called a cone of uncertainty. Now, you can see that that cone gets wider and wider, which means that the uncertainty around the prediction gets much larger the further we are predicting out into the future. This makes sense. Think about predicting the weather for tomorrow is much easier than predicting the weather for 10 days from now. As I have mentioned before, it is very important to differentiate between a population and a sample throughout this class. Again, a population is the collection of all possible individual entities, subjects, or measurements of interest for a particular investigation. There are parameters that characterize the population and those parameters will be unknown basically forever. In order to learn something about the population parameters, you need to collect a sample. And once you have collected a sample, you can use statistics to analyze the sample. Usually it should be a representative sample. And based on statistics, you can then infer something about the parameters of the entire population. Think about the upcoming election where the unknown population parameter is how many people support Donald Trump and how many people support Joe Biden. Now, you cannot sample the entire population, but you actually have to do a sample. You will see that usually when you watch the news, that the sample is around 1,000 or 2,000 people, and those are representative members of society, of the voting population, and based on this representative sample, you can say something about the outcome of the election. Using a sample rather than a population is necessary because sometimes it is simply not possible to ask the entire population. It may be too expensive to sample the entire population, or it is also possible that you destruct the units of observation. For example, if you're thinking about quality control and you are a, a tire manufacturer and you want to know when does, a tire, when does a tire need to be replaced or after how many miles do you re need to replace a tire. And then if you're testing some units, then the unit of analysis, the tire in this case, gets destructed during the test. To finish this lecture, let me say something about variables. Variables can be quantitative, qualitative, and it can also be discrete versus continuous. Now, qualitative variables are non-numeric, and they describe a particular qualitative characteristics of the analysis, of the unit of analysis. So if you're thinking about a person, for example, then a qualitative variable would be the gender, or it would be the political affiliation, or even the state of residence. We will see in the regression analysis that we can transform those qualitative variables into numerical values. We will call them dummy variables. Now, on the other hand, you can also have quantitative variables, which of course are very easy to handle in statistics because they're numeric, such as age, income, GPA, or the number of kids you have. Now, quantitative variables can be subdivided further into two categories, either discrete or continuous. Now discrete means that you can take two very close values and there is no value in between. So think about the number of people in a class. If you take two very close values, for example 38 students versus 39 students, then it is not possible to find a value in between. You cannot have 38.5 students in a class. 
So the number would be a discrete variable. When you have a continuous variable, then no matter how close you get between two values, there will always be a value in the middle, or there will always be a value in between. So if you think, for example, about the weight of a person, then this is a continuous variable. We will see that very often it is easier to simply model a variable as continuous, even if it seems seemingly discrete. Think about, for example, the values of homes, then yes, theoretically, the value of a home is a discrete variable because you can have a home valued at $200,000 and you can have a home valued at $200,000 and one cent, then you are not able to find a value in between. But in reality or in practice, it may be easier to simply assume that we are looking at a continuous random variable. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me and ask your questions.